Hi everyone, and welcome to week 40. This week I'm continuing in a series of mixing and mastering videos, and this week I'm going to be covering equalization. Now EQ can be your friend or your foe, depending on your knowledge of how they work, and what type of EQ you might need to use for a specific task. For this video, I'll be using the SSL channel EQs of the Record Mixer. But most of the techniques and concepts that I'm going to cover here can also be accomplished in Reason if you're using the M-Class EQ device, except for the high-pass and low-pass filters. I'm using a song I wrote a little while back called My Beautiful, and we're going to have a listen to some of it without any EQ on the tracks at all. As you can hear, there are quite a few tracks that need some help to stand out in the mix, and a few that sound like they are stepping on each other in the same frequency range. Before we start to do any serious tweaking, let's cover a few basics and use this bass track as the test track. Now there are many types of EQ, and each one has a different effect on how it sculpts the sound. On the record channel strip, the EQ section actually has a few types already set up and ready to use. The HF and low F, or high frequency and low frequency in this area, are both shelving type EQs. And what they do is allow you to select a corner frequency or endpoint, which is where the sound will start to be cut or boosted, depending on how you set the gain knob. To the left of center is cut, and to the right is boost. Shelving EQs are good for adding or cutting a little more top end or low end, and if you use an analogy of a paintbrush, this would be a wide brush. I'll discuss the bell and E buttons in a moment. Graphically, it would look a bit like this. The HMF and LMF, or high medium frequency and low medium frequency, are both fully parametric EQs, and they allow you to select a center frequency from which to cut or boost. You set how narrow or wide affected frequencies will be using the Q knob. This is also known as bandwidth. The higher the Q value, the more narrow the bandwidth. The lower values will give you a much broader bandwidth. This is really like an entire toolbox of paintbrushes, since every time you tweak the Q parameter, it's like switching to a completely different brush size. Parametric EQs are really the way to go to completely sculpt and mold a track, so you can remove any offending frequencies or boost ones that you need a bit more of. Graphically, it would look a bit like this. Now getting back to the bell and E buttons. These only apply to the HF and LF section of the EQ. When bell and E are both on, then the LF and HF both switch to a peaking type EQ, which is basically a parametric EQ, but with a fixed Q or bandwidth. With bell active and E set to off, the gain setting will now affect the bandwidth, with higher gain settings producing a much more narrow bandwidth and any cut in gain producing a much more broad bandwidth. This gives the peaking EQ a much more gentle slope and produces a much different effect. The last type of EQs that are available on the channel strip are the HPF and LPF, or high pass filter and low pass filter. Just like the filters on the synthesizer that share the same name, these EQs are great for completely isolating a specific frequency range for a track. The LPF lets low frequencies pass through and filters out or removes the high frequencies from the signal at the specified range. The HPF does exactly the opposite and lets high frequencies pass while filtering out the low frequencies. Most of the time, when I'm doing a mix, I will go to the HPF and LPF first before I start to do any other EQ tweaking. For example, if I really want the kick and the bass to stand out in the mix, 
I will make sure to use the HPF filter to completely remove any frequencies from all of the other tracks that might be stepping on the same low frequency range of the kick and bass, which usually sits around the range of 100 to 150 hertz or so. I used the analogy of paintbrushes earlier because basically, when you're doing a mix, you need to step back from your song and listen to the sounds and think of them as colors. Which colors or sounds do you want to blend well? Which ones do you want to be more pronounced and stand out? Too often it happens when you're writing or arranging a song, you might go for some really huge synth sound, for example, and think that it's going to work really well in the song. And then when you listen to it with all of the tracks playing, you start to hear that other things are getting lost in the mix. Well, here's the trick with EQ. If you were able to hear some of the individual tracks or parts of one of your favorite songs without some of the other accompanying parts, you might think that the sound of a particular guitar or synth sounds really weak or thin. But when it's mixed in with all the other parts, it sits in just in the right place of the mix. That's where the attention to detail comes in. When you are mixing and tweaking EQs for a sound, make sure you alternate between listening to the sound soloed and also with the other tracks playing back to hear how it's sitting in the mix. Notice that I said listen. That's right, listen. Close your eyes. Listen to the mix. Tweak a knob with your eyes closed and listen to how it's changing. There's a lot that's been said about needing to see an EQ curve graphically to mix, and honestly, in my opinion, though graphic EQs are really nice to look at, we listen to songs with our ears and not our eyes. So in the end, I believe that the way the EQ is set up on the Record Mixer channel, without graphic and just knobs, is the best way to work. The last thing I wanted to discuss was the concept of cutting and boosting. It's a general rule of thumb among audio engineers that you should always try to cut frequencies out of a track to get it to sit in the mix where you want before boosting. If a track sounds a bit muddy, cut some lows or low mids and raise the volume a bit. If it's a bit too bright, cut some highs. Then, if you want to accentuate some frequencies, go ahead and boost, but be careful how much you boost and be careful not to boost the same frequency range for lots of tracks. So now using all that info, we can make some tweaks to my song, and we're going to start to hear a difference right away. Well, I hope that this week's video helped you get a little bit more knowledge on equalization and enables you to get the best sounding mixes possible. Well, that's it for another week. And again, I'm James Bernard for Propellerhead Software, and I will see you all soon with yet another tip.